Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back to Snakes and Otters, episode 119. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis, somehow sitting in the captain's chair this time. Not sure how that one happened. Uh, we're back to history, guys. Well, we took a vote when you weren't there. And... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I would not have this episode in anyone's hands but yours, Francis. Oh, you are so kind, sir. I'll have to slip him a few shackles later. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about... I guess we're kind of... This is different. It's a history episode, but it's probably more of a study of economics in a little bit. You can't well, not do this one without well, that. Certainly for the topic, you can't talk about... This part of, of this movement in history, yeah, without talking about the economic, uh, but is there's a huge political impact as well, right? So, you know, yeah. as well as military. That's right, so, which is going to be the more interesting part yeah. Yeah. here. But uh, it's the rise of fascism. That's yeah. what we're talking but about here. We covered the battles, right? And that's good, but it's empty unless you are covering. Well, how did we get in this damn mess anyway? Yeah. So. You know, it's not enough. We always maintain, of course, you can't understand the 20th century without understanding World War One, Right. But what does that really mean? Yeah. And this is the period between the wars that makes, or that you have to try to make sense out of. Which is what they were trying, ultimately, is what they were trying to do anyway. They've just gone through this horrific uh, upheaval of just, well, of everything. And, and it, rather, yeah. this is not a spiritual thing. Although I'm sure that's some that yeah. went on for many people, it's more about well now what do we do? Yeah, because the old ways didn't work, <coughs> and part of it got bad yeah. when with with imposition of new ideas that were foreign to certain people. Where we'll kind of kind of talk about this, but before we get into the history of it, I want to talk about what the hell is fascism. Depends on who you ask. Well, that's right. Exactly. And if you ask a 19-year-old, I think you'll get a different answer. Then. Well, the reasons why we see the need to lay this out from an economic perspective. Well, Chief, economic and political. And, well, I'm going to start yeah. at the basic with economic uh, because it's easy It's easy to see the difference there. Yeah. And recognize that, to be honest, practically speaking, they don't end up looking different sometimes <laughs> on the street, but they, they are intended to be. Fascism is... From an economic perspective, where the government controls the means of production, pure and simple. Where, where you produce, the, there's still a private owner. That's correct. But that private Perhaps, owner... not always. Not always. No, yeah. But there could still be a private owner, but that owner is being directed yep. at what to produce, not by the marketplace, not at all. but by the government. government. Right. right. Whereas communism is government ownership of the means of production. Of, so every of, of everything, of, yes. yeah, exactly, you know, land, factories, all, all of that stores. goes into the yeah, ownership in name as opposed to ownership de facto. Right. I mean, right. realistically, that's to me that's the main difference. Yeah. Because if the government is controlling everything, they own it. If you can't decide what you're going to do, then you know the fact that you run it better than somebody else is the only reason you got to keep it. Well, that's right, and uh, and that's one of the reasons. That's one of the attractions of fascism versus communism in the 20s and 30s is because we don't want to do the work. We know there are people that are experts in this. We just want to control them and tell them how to do it, yeah. which was an authoritarian model without having to take everything on themselves. Somehow that was seen as allowing a certain amount of freedom to the people. It's not really... No. It, it, it's well, a smokescreen in some respects. It is. It's a huge smokescreen. It's you know a euphemism of the third way. Right. Um, which it isn't. But. No. So, when we think about... So, let's talk about some more ways to describe fascism. Yes, please. So, yes. so fascism, it's not just economic. It's political as well. Absolutely. And how it starts often is a populist movement. Mm -hmm. uh, which yes. is interesting because, uh, like many of these kinds of movements, it turns on the people, ultimately, mm -hmm. who begin it. Yes. You know, the Russian Revolution turns on those who initiate it, and it becomes the Bolshevik Revolution, and the communists take over. Uh, in, in Spain, you know, there's a, uh, it's mainly a so church and state versus the, the, uh, the liberals, what we call liberals, because uh, honestly, I have a hard time uh, 
calling fascism far right because I think it is so close to ultimately communism that they are brothers. Oh, that's correct. It's, it's like a circle. They're both exactly. They're, they're, it's a circle. It's not they, a line. It's, they it's, they measure themselves the distance the long way around <laughs> from each other. But practically speaking, pra- they, yes. they look very much the yeah. same. Practically speaking, and that's wherein the problem lies. Is yeah, because it's, people don't re- uh, many people that do not understand may bandy those terms back and forth like they're the same thing and interchangeable. They're not, but they look like they are. Well, and, you know, when we look at these kinds of movements, in Germany it is called uh, National Socialism, because that's what it is. It's literally the government controlling everything, Mm -hmm. but it's with that nationalistic intent. Uh, And that's very important because... Very much so, yes. You know, every country loves its patriots. Not every country is so good with the nationalists Uh, running things. And it's a very subtle distinction. There's a difference between my people and country are fantastic and I want everybody to be like us as opposed to my country is so great and fantastic that we are better than you. Yes. And And we want to either eliminate or take you over. Yeah, Is subjugate, subjugate, or yes. also, you know, you're bad. By force, we're going to do something about you. There's always like. a a f- element of force in these situations right. as well. Just yeah. like with the communists, mm-hmm. it yeah. had to be through revo- revolution. That's right. right. Because communists believed in a worldwide revolution that they were not willing to back away from. I mean, that's why the wars in Vietnam and Korea were all so worrisome because it was, you know, all. The communists have the aim to take over everything, and this is we're seeing it happen, right. so we must push back. That's the intention. Because it, it's two sides of the same coin, and I'm glad you used the word Bolshevism. Because that's, that's more than communism, that's what you really have to describe. The, the Russian Revolution became not a communist revolution, but they specifically said it is a Bolshevik socialist revolution. Correct. And the difference then becomes, like you said... Francis, socialism, the Marxism, Leninism is a workers' revolution that is supposed to spread everywhere. Where fascism then makes a change, even though it's, in a practical sense, not any different. Nuanced. The the practical difference then becomes throwing out the idea of a worldwide revolution and substituting ultranationalism as Robert's saying. And then that ultimately, after Italy, after Mussolini, becomes the model, becomes the example. He's the one kicking out the socialist part of it and saying, no, it's an ultranationalist movement. Then Hitler ups the ante right. with, no, it's a racialist movement. Which which is another aspect of fascism that's almost endemic to it. You have to have an external enemy, real or imagined. Or an internal enemy. Or internal enemy. Maybe an enemy. Because, I mean, in Germany it, has, it becomes an internal correct. enemy. This, how this takes hold is the, the Jews, Jews stabbed us, us in the back. Yeah, exactly and, the phrase. Stabbed yeah, us in, in the back. back. Exactly. That's why we lost the war. Fascism can the only best. survive and thrive because sooner or later control gets very wearisome for yes. no reason. But if you give them the quote unquote emergency, the need. Well, that's the same with communism. There's, yeah, there's the external. There's, there's uh, always an enemy, enemy, which is the capitalists. Right, yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, this whole idea of the nationalism part, the part that makes this, uh, uh, I think, why the left nas- uh, lashes onto that. As a, that makes them the far right. Well, okay, if you want to put this on a spectrum, yeah. But like I said, they come back around and meet on the other yes, side right. of this of this circle. They're the same thing. But when you look at the nationalism part, it is really, it's just a to me, it's a means to an end. Yes. Because especially when you look at Germany, Germany is the preeminent example of fascism. They're the one everybody's going to think about. Nazi Germany. Right. I don't want to mean, you know, Germany <laughs> today, but Nazi Germany. Uh, because they were the most successful at it. Right. They Although were. you can make a case Spain was, because Spain stayed out of World War II. Uh, well, and Spain, S- Spain lasted until Franco's death in 75. Right. So Yes, technically, you know, yes it did. So it was, you could say it was certainly the longest lasting fascist state. Right. But it didn't act like a fascist state. In, you know, it, it, the peace was brought. 
the piece of the gun, you could say that, yes. Well, but, yes, piece of the point of a gun is a piece of a sword. Right. And uh, But as a general rule, uh, after the revolution, Franco held things together for a long time. And when he passes away, it, it was a pretty bloodless transition back to the other way. Right, back to the monarch. Exactly. Juan Carlos, is he's a direct line of the previous king. That's right. So, when we look at when fascism takes control... The, one of the most common things about it is is expansionism, just like communism. But communism is expansion of the movement, mm. right? Ultimately, Spre- under spreading the, the revolution, spreading the revolution, ultimately under the direction, if not control, yes, of the the, the Soviets in mm-hmm. in Russia in Soviet Union. Whereas with fascism, it's about as Germany puts it, Lebensraum. That's right. Yeah. Which is living space. So we're not going to convert you to our way of political work. We're going to take you over. Well, and we're either going to push you out yeah. or exterminate you, one way or the other. No, that'll do it too. And we're going to colonize. Germany's intent was to colonize. Colonize Eastern Europe. Exactly. Hey, this is really nice land. Too bad there's already people here. Hey, I think hey, we can fix that. We can fix that. Let's just get rid of them. Exactly. And we... Which is also what, what leads to... Uh, the Holocaust being not just the Jews. It's those people in Eastern Europe that were the most, initially the most vocal about opposing them and mm-hmm. being dissidents, however you want to put it. The and, Poles were and, from some of the very first. They, yes. they went in there and they just, I mean, that that was seen as, you know, this is ours and we will just exterminate Well, there you. is a long history uh, of back and forth with Germany and Poland over which country should be in control of that particular piece of land. Right. So, and plus that is also the buffer state between Russia and Germany. Which was one of the reasons it was. I mean, it goes back, I mean, uh, the Teutonic Knights and all that sort of stuff like that. Slav Slav versus Teuton and and the whole bit. It's a very old story. It's it's, It's a very old story. So, that I think is one of the most important differences between communism as we see it. Because obviously it's not true communism. It's, it's... You know, because the revolution may happen, but the ultimate end never appears, right. and it never will. Because once the revolution happens, just like with socialism, a dictator takes over, and a party structure happens, and basically you have what becomes an oligarchy slash dictatorship, mm-hmm. because the dictator is always chosen from a select few. Yeah, right. And it, it's no different yeah. in whether it's the Politburo or yes. the Grand Council of Fascism. Or whatever. Exactly. You've got your insiders and your outsiders. And your outsiders. Yeah. And the outsiders are usually the populist movement who brought them to power. Because they're the peasants. And you see this anti-egalitarian movement happen in every time this happens. Whether it's a socialist state, mm-hmm. or it's a communist state, or a full-on fascist state. Because if you look at Venezuela, Venezuela is, the, is a prime example of a socialist revolution that devolves into a dictatorship where the dictators are now oppressing the very people they said they were there to help. Yes. And so in reality, even though Venezuela is not uh, uh, you know, looking to expand to take over other, although I'm surprised that they're not, simply because... They do support other... Well, yeah, but it's not a other, full-out movement. Yeah. So um, they yeah, try, but I mean, they... They're eating zoo animals, so they don't really have a lot of dough to really right. foment uh, stuff in Ecuador or Right, you know, which, you Columbia know, when you're a socialist anything. and you can control everything, you, you, you quickly find out, you know, maybe you're not the expert that should be in control. Yeah. But all of these movements, they start out certain ways for different reasons. Yeah. But they all seem to end up in the same place. Because they're the same thing. Eventually, they're the same Eventually, thing. Eventually, they're the same thing. So, fascism and socialism and communism and Bolshevism are all the same thing. They all suck. That's a pretty blistering indictment of the whole thing. <laughs> pretty much. So, well, yeah. Well, it, they it, all it, suck. It's, it's meant to be clear, clear-eyed clear in looking at this. Yeah. Because we have the benefit of hindsight for this. Because it's not like we're just pontificating here. All of these things we have, there's a historical basis for all these yes. failures that eventually they, they you know they, they go belly up. They assume room temperature, as someone will say. But so so that's a good layout of these differences like you want to do, Francis. And I think I'm cutting Robert off, but No, no, you're good. Okay. You're good. So now though I wanna push you a little bit. Take us to well, how does this get started? 
I mean, whose whose idea was it? Whose big idea was this? Big ideas usually suck too, by the way. Okay. Well, <laughs> it, it depends on the purpose. <laughs> well, because all philosophical, all good philosophical movements are built on a big idea, but it's what you do with it. It's yeah. Like, well, I mean, anybody that's ever walked into a room and said, "What's the big idea?" usually is encountering something horrible. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> What's the big idea? Well, we the crew we've already talked about the crucible of all this. It's World War One. Yeah, it's and the, the world was you know uh, a world unmade you know to, to steal right. from G H. The last of the monarchs, with the exception of England, go away. Right, and especially on the on the losing sides, obviously. Right, you know the Ottoman right. Empire is destroyed. The Habsburg Empire is destroyed. The Germanic Empire, for lack of a better term, is, is destroyed. destroyed. Yeah, yeah. the Hohenzollerns are, are out, and you have essentially. Uh, I mean, Hemingway called this this inter, interwar period the lost generation. There's a lot of truth to that, politically speaking, too, because you didn't understand how in the world are we supposed to go back? We don't. Where's that strong man we've been used to? Where's the emperor? Right. They don't know how how to govern themselves. So because you it's know, a foreign concept to them. It's imp- and worse, it's imposed. Right. And so you know, I think this is a good contrast because. You know, obviously we're, we're we're Americans. We speak English. Our background is entirely different. Even as a country, you know, you can say, "Well, you guys were colonies of England, so that was imposed." But you know, when you're when you're ruled an entire ocean away, where it takes a month for somebody from England to get to America and vice versa, there is a, a an amount of autonomy mm-hmm. that is inherent in the situation. Yeah, it's just yeah. so de facto. It is it's just Americans. America comes out of the people. Not who threw off the shackles of a tyrant so much as people who realized, you know, we've been governing ourselves. We don't need this guy looking over our shoulder because, honestly, he's just a pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah it, it, because it we had 200 years to figure out all that and knowing, yeah, yeah. maybe we should do this ourselves. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's a reaction yeah, yeah. to an inefficient parliament and saying, look, we just, you're right. We don't need you. We're, we're cool. Right. We've been getting we along pretty well. We're ta- we got, and, and, we know, got like, this. No representation without tax, or no taxation without representation. That's important because it shows how Americans were used to governing themselves largely from the beginning. That's the difference between the U.S. and where democracies try to be planted elsewhere. Mm-hmm. That his- history of self governance does not exist. Because it's impossible for it to exist. That's right. You had to have something that put it in place. Like in France, you know, France has the French Revolution and they have Napoleon and all these things here where they work, they got a hundred years of working through it by the time the republics take hold. And of course, they've gotten their butts kicked a few times too. Well, which republic? Because now they're on the what? The sixth or seventh? I, one? I, I forget I which think one it's it is. The, officially, the fifth. I think, oh, it's, it's, the, still I think the fifth? it's the fifth republic. Okay, That's I thought correct. we were past so, the fifth. So, okay. so, is this another opportunity to. Fill the Woodrow Wilson pinata with candy and start taking a swing. Well, if it's not, let's make it one. I mean, well, is, no, this, it, it is, is this his fault? It, 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 it is, and you're you're exact. Now, let's not just you know. Let's go ahead and put the Lloyd George and Clemenceau right next to him because they're yeah. the th- those are the three that really and well, was, and and Italy is a mess all of unto itself. Even right. though it's one of the victors, right? It's they've suffered horribly in this. And still don't have a direction, and still a huge mess. And Mussolini is, of all things, a journalist, a political commentator who steps into this leadership void that they have. Nobody knows what to do, and it takes hold because famously, well, at least he made the trains run on time, and right. we can get to work. Right, and that's that's you're exactly right. That's what that's how fascism arose there. And I submit to you. It was almost an accident uh, that he, you know, you, you just the words you just spoke speak kind of to the absurdity of all this. Yeah. Well, in a way, that is so very Italian too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that they, you know, do things by accident, but compared to the Germans and the British and even the Soviets, you know, they don't exactly have the most drive in comparison, and that's not a bad thing. I'm, uh, you know, because. You know, they, they tend to come off as more of a laid back country, which I like. So they they take dumps without plans. Is exactly. What you're saying. Yeah, yes, yeah the Italians can take a dump without a plan. That's you right. know, 
I mean, it's the culture of, of Europe, or the cradle of European culture, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe they rested on those laurels for, for well, a long time. Well, irony of ironies, yeah, I mean, because they were the Roman Empire, you know? Uh, you know as empires go, this it's is the, the big, big one. one, that's right. And yet, all of a sudden, that has sort of changed, but uh, again... Well, the, not all of a sudden, it was a pretty... Right, well, I mean, at, at, after, after World War One, everything is all messed up. It's all, you know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, that sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> I love that way. I you love know, that's a, that right there is a great point. So one of the things we haven't talked about, especially the German fascism, one of the selling points was the saving the culture from the degradations and the, the, yes. the licentiousness of the modern culture. So that's one of the reasons why it is equated with the, the right and conservatism, even though ultimately fascism is the enemy of conservatives and liberals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, because it's seen as an appeal to standard morals. Right. It's yes. not just about bringing peace and making the trains run on time. Right. Which and was Bonapartism. And, right. That's and, kind of what that happened. Hindenburg is this conservative rock in Germany. Yes. And he acquiesces the again the, the the conservative elements in the business community acquiesce because hey at least they aren't the Bolsheviks right well, well and, because and they see themselves as a weak, in yeah. because they need the money right yeah. and they see themselves in a very weakened state because economically they are I mean you got wheelbarrow loads of uh, in marks Germany, in order yes. to, in order to get bread well so, and that's one of the reasons why the populism aspect works so well mm -hmm. because when it takes a wheelbarrow full of worthless paper to buy a loaf of bread. Something is fundamentally broken. Right, and they realize that if they don't act, uh, that Bolshevism is very attractive to many people. And it also has a predatory aspect to yeah. it. They were, yes. well, that one of the reasons that Hitler rose so well is they were afraid of Bolshevism. And Hitler, of course, co-ops this very much because he hated it. Yes. Uh, and he saw this as, as a, a serious problem, too. So let's Which give it an alternative. Because, you know, first of all... Uh, Lenin, where does he spend his exile time? Yeah, Germany. Germany, that's right, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's somewhat ironic because, you know, the, like, like we said, the ultimate end goals uh, are the same. And some of the methods the are methods, the same. Yeah, the methods end up being the same repression um, because people yearn for control of their own destiny. Yeah, now and, that is true. And to, the, take, to take their destinies away from them takes the type of those same type of methods. Well, and also, and there's a bit of a smokescreen too, you have to put a reason for them to exist and to give their destiny willingly, if it's done the way it's intended, over to the state. Yeah. And that's you, very important because the state, whether you're talking about fascism or communism, mm -hmm. the state is all. That's correct. Yes. And the now, individual serves the state. Yes. Always. Yes. Communism may say, well, you know, we're here for the workers. Yeah. Bullshit. Bolshevik bullshit. Yes. <laughs> yes. I like that. That sounds because, that sounds very and good. you know, for for Hitler it was the Volk, the people. Yeah. But the Volk really meant the state. It That's really correct. Did. I mean, they, they saw those things. And the Fatherland, the Third Reich. That's right. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that is reaching back to that militaristic yeah. autocracy that Bismarck put in place. Yeah. You know, all, back in the eighteen sixties and seventies, all of a sudden people yearned for that because you know. Things were efficient during that time. We they were one well, step away from global domination. Yeah, you know, it's not just efficiency; it's that you know, there's that nostalgia for better times. That's right. Yeah, and better times yeah. are often blurred in people's memories. You know, we always look back on our youth as a better time than than today. Mm -hmm. Everybody does yeah. that, whether it's true or not. Yeah. Well, in the case of Germany, though, uh, from the time that the you know Bismarck puts Germany in place, you know, Prussia subsumes all that. They were at the top of their game. They, they were. were. They were economic powerhouses in, in just and a, military and military too. Nobody yeah. matched them. I mean, they go in and they whoop the Austrians' butt. Boom! Turn right around and just two years later, whoop the Frenchmen's butt. Boom! And all of a sudden, this upstart nation, which is you know not even two decades old, is the most powerful other than Britain force on in in Europe. Yeah. And well, you know. Two decades old in that particular form. Well, that's correct, yeah. Anyway, it was seen as a new entity, uh, even though, uh, because they were unified. They had not been unified before. Although Prussia itself, 
after Napoleon. The Germany's versus the Germany is is you know one of these days that would be a great episode to talk. We about talk the about it all the time. So we're going to have. Well, yeah. you know, we talk about the history of, as I like to put it, the history of Europe is the history of the the Habsburgs. Habsburgs, yes. Yeah. You know, and it, well, they certainly treated most of Europe as if it were their backyard. They certainly did. Yes. Yes. So. So, um, yeah. just a quick plug here real fast, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a break. But um, since we're swinging at the Wilson Piñata, I want to do a, a Snakes and Otters plug for Arthur Herman's 1917 yes, uh, that I've finished recently. That, yeah. you, you did Terrific a Terrific book. I mean, we like Arthur Herman. I, I've got three of his uh, books on the shelf. I want to get some more. Uh, it's really, really good. Um it, it's a you really get to see the parallel in this idealistic thinking and how it blinds you to practical realities. And I think it's the best description of the Russian Revolution I've read so far. Out of all these World War One books, which of course the Russian Revolution's inescapable from World War One. Well, yeah, yeah, they're, they're coterminous. I mean, with each yeah, other. you it's can't you can't talk one without talking the other. This really helped to make sense of what's going on in Russia because there's so many things, Kerensky and these worker Soviets and these committees and everything's a committee and everything's a plan. And in the middle of it steps, you know, Vladimir Lenin with this idea of basically we're going to run Russia and no matter who dies to make that happen, Mm -hmm. we're good with that. Right. So. And this is one of the common elements of all of these movements we're talking about that are so similar. It doesn't matter who dies. Yeah. And, yeah and sometimes, if it, it, when it does matter, it's because it's the enemy that we have chosen to fight. Right. Or to vilify, to rally the, the people around, even though, you know, they're really the yeah. same ones. Yeah. And it's, you know, it contrasts this episode with our recent other history that's not a World War II like this one is. Uh, of our kiss my drunk Russian ass. I knew you were going to say that. So, I knew you were going to use that. You know, you that, that one, line. you know, that's where you see the uh, the Russian power structure actually back off. Right. It finally does matter. And, and, right. and they we don't want people to die here. They they and it, that, they, the world has grown yeah. in this in the 60 years during the Cold War and they realize you know people individual people do matter. Mm-hmm. And it's well, not just because there are cameras everywhere. It's a little bit of it. But ultimately, we recognize, you know, we can be better than that. Those old days, and Yeltsin was famous for saying this, you know, those old days of rough and tumble are over when that happened. Yeah. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that. We don't, sh- we don't send people to the gulags anymore. We don't put them up against the wall. The days of Stalin are over. Right, uh, but you know what? We do send them to the gulags now. Because... Without that history of self-rule, mm-hmm. you have somebody like a Vladimir Putin come in, who's a strong man. Yeah. yeah. And he very well could end up being, you know, what history would say, what well, he was the, the post-democratic uh, uh, Russia dictator. Because yeah. realistically, that's what he is. That's what he is. It appears that way. There's just not a, a quote, ism. Behind him, other than Putinism, yeah. Putin, I was going to say, is Putinism a thing? Lining his own pockets is basically his deal. Okay. Basically, um, yeah. And <clears throat> he has to keep power to keep lining his pockets. And as soon as he's not in power, he won't be able to line his pockets, and he's going to end up like Mussolini. Well, and he's he's a he's a great example of so many of these guys who are the ultimate narcissists. Yep. Because you don't become a dictator without being a narcissist. You know, thinking that you are the the savior. The savior, yes. The savior Only complex. you have have the secret knowledge the, yes. in order to make I'm this the only happen. One, I'm the only one that can save Russia. Yeah. So Exactly. So, what time is it? It's bourbon time. Bourbon time. Bourbon, time. bourbon break. Bourbon break time. Francis, you're captain. Why don't you go first, brother? Well, I'm drinking your quarter horse, sir. Uh, I had you... Uh, we're, we're here, uh, you know, at, at Studio M once again at Nakatomi Plaza down the hall from, uh, behind the waterfall from Ellis's office. Uh, that's not exactly that's right. That's pretty close. It's yeah. pretty darn close. Down the hall from Ellis and behind the waterfall. Behind the waterfall, exactly. And, and we changed up uh, Studio M this time. And That's right. I, I yeah, we're in the comfy chairs. The comf- yeah, I, I like this. To, let's try to do it comfort. 
Uh, I'm throwing the laptop screen wirelessly on the big TV, so we'll be able to kind of track what's going on here. Right, and, and see when our levels are too high or too low. And we can monitor our time a little better. And, again, on the couch. Comfortable. That's absolutely, exactly. that's right. Yes. And drinking some of your wonderful bourbon, sir. Uh, that quarter horse bottle yeah. that you, uh, we still haven't finished. Uh, well, uh, he, you know, he asked me, what do you want to drink? I said, whatever you want to finish off first. <laughs> So it's the quarter horse. Uh, quarter horse, here. yeah, quarter horse, an old tub, and then we're going to save the wood for it. I think maybe a little bit. No, that's fine. That's fine. So, I mean, have, but quarter horse is always smooth. It is always clean. I like it a lot. See, I don't, I don't call this one a smooth one. No, uh, compared to most of the ones we call smooth, I think this one. I, I don't call it harsh. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's got a little bit more of that bite to it. Um, okay. Especially when you first drink it, it's very much in the mouth. Uh, maybe a little bit towards the back at the top of the throat. Yeah. Uh, whereas many of the ones we call so smooth uh, are, are are milder, I mean. Uh, well, I mean, smooth is just so much is really just a better term for this. It, it it's a, uh, a more gradual uh, okay. uh, impact. This is very much a in your face, not necessarily in a bad way. Right. Yeah. Because uh, I do like it. Uh, it's a nice change up though from what some of the stuff we've been mm-hmm. drinking of late. It is unique. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't think we've ever. I don't think anything else tastes just like this. Might be. Now you're having neat. I'm having it neat. I've been drinking it neat lately. Yes. You got stones. Stones. It, right. It, so it's it's neat but chilled in the sense that there's no yeah. there's no ice in here to, to yeah. water it down. Straight up would be the better way to put it. Yes. Right. Yeah. I did pour myself a treat of the Woodford, a nice little snort with some ice, and yeah, I mean I get it. This is this has got a ton of complexity here in this flavor. There's a reason it's one of our go-tos. Yeah, I mean, it's and this, this is regular Woodford. Yeah, this regular is not Woodford. even the Woodford Double Oak or anything. This is just regular Woodford Reserve, and the complexity is really something. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, uh, yeah, it's one of the very best. There's citrus, there's oak, there's caramel, um, there's a little maple to it. There is a little bit of everything going on here. I'm telling you, you know, Martin, you have uh, inspired me to seriously consider giving up soft drinks. Really? Yes. Because I'm, I'm of you. that commentary. Because I have a hard time pulling all those out. So I recently talked to uh, the wife's best friend, uh, who has also given up soft drinks. Really? She gave them up for Lent, not this year, I think it was last year. Uh, and so I asked her, so tell me about your taste buds. And she was talking about the same thing. Taste, you know, her taste buds have come alive again. So uh, I haven't started this yet because... I do the Sip and Save Club at Circle K. So for six bucks, every day I can get a free drink. Oh. So, and oh, you know, I'm always yeah. going somewhere, I stop to get the fountain drink. Because actually, the fountain drinks are easier for me to drink than a bottle of a soft drink because of the lap band. Yeah. Uh, the carbonation is milder. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Is what I find. So, uh, the, the just, ice waters down just a touch. And yes. Maybe that's why I don't like fountain much. drinks. I prefer the bottle. I, I want that full leaded. Uh, well, experience. Just, yeah, for me the carbonation just it, you know, just hangs yeah, there. You, like you a have a reason oh, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. for it to, to yeah. need so, something different. So well, I think uh, when I'm at the end of this cycle, which actually just started, because I'm like, well, I can't do it because I was thinking about it. And the next time I go in, it's like, do you want to renew? I was like, oh, I'm not ready to do this. I need to plan this. I got to figure out my strategy here. Right. So that's what I'm doing this month. So I'm seriously thinking about one month from be yesterday or the day before, whatever that day was. Uh, I will be soft drink free. That is, yeah. well, now, I'm not guaranteeing that. I can't say I'm soft drink free yet. I'm down to about one a week. Right. See, I'm thinking i got to plan my gradual yeah. decrease. Yeah. And and I do still have a little bit of sugar uh, in like a vitamin water. I do like those. So it has a little bit of sugar. See, I'm not doing the... Uh, flavored tea will have a little bit of sugar, but not as much as the See, I'm doing drinks. the diet stuff. So, because yeah. I can't add the sugar for the extra calories. Yeah. Oof. Well, but, Otterites, uh, if you're listening out there, contact us and convince me to do what these guys are doing and go with the water route or whatever it takes. Now, I do drink a lot of water. I probably drink, uh, on most days, two liters of water because I've got a one liter metal cup, which holds the, the chill fantastically. I drink one of those in the morning most days and one of those in the afternoon. Yeah. Depends on how early I get my drink that day. <laughs> now, if I yeah. go out first thing, probably the morning uh, water gets set aside yeah because it takes me a while to go through one of these yeah now i'm uh black coffee in the morning at work when it's cold out i'm, I'm a coffee guy in the morning yeah so I'm, every day is 
you know, the cure egg, black coffee. Then lunch is usually, um, again, like a vitamin water or an unsweet tea, something like that. And then at night is maybe a flavored tea, unsweet tea, or a water, or maybe a beer, or something like that with dinner. And like I said, for a treat, try to one day a week, a real actual soft drink, and, and just try to do it that way, and just try to treat it as a treat. Right, right. And I haven't really made a distinction between the, like a bottled one versus a, like a fountain or a cup. Usually the treat's a fountain one because it's usually going with a meal somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right. And, right. And so you're right. I, I do a little better with the fountain ones and getting them down. The bottled ones, I can maybe get halfway through a bottled one, mm-hmm. and then it starts to taste too acidic. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of like, ooh, why am I drinking this? Right. Okay. So, you know, I, I get that. that. That's certainly a valid way to do that. So, for me, when I've tried to give up soft drinks for Lent, it's been the missing the carbonation, that yeah. texture in the drink. Yeah. So, I have found these sparkling ice drinks. They're lemonades. Yeah. And I get them at Sam's. They're usually, you know... 15 bucks for a case. Yeah. 24 of these things. Multiple yeah. Uh, yeah. flavors. Now, the carbonation is not what I miss. See, for I me, that's that the all. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of sweet. It's the sugars. The sugars. Sweet. That's yeah. that's what I miss. Well, I'm eating that. lemonade in their diet lemonades, yeah. too. So I still get the sweetness and the carbonation. So we went from bourbon to diet drinks and how to give up soft drinks so that the bourbon will taste better. Taste better. Right. Because that's it's the a reason. Priorities, people. Priorities. priorities. So... Yeah, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm some kind of hero. I'm not doing CrossFit or anything here. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a vegan CrossFit firefighter. Well, uh, <laughs> this is audio. You could lie, you know, and nobody would know any better. But I am trying to really, really cut back on, on the soft drinks in particular because of the sugar and do something different. And then I discovered, hey, I can actually, like, taste stuff and not everything tastes like corn syrup. Right. Right. So, so I, that. That, that's excellent. So back to the rise of fascism. The rise of fascism. Take over, Captain. Oh, for Lord's sakes. Really? No. no <laughs> I'm kidding. Kidding. Uh, but seriously, you're exactly right. Mussolini is where this starts. But we're, we're talking three co- things that happen at the same time. Fasci- the three fascist states that we recognize are Italy first, chronologically. Yeah. And then Spain, which is which becomes Germany and Spain are rising at the right same around time. Around the same time, that's correct. Because again, Franco's coming to power with support from Mussolini and Hitler. Correct. Right. Spain is unique in that there is a actual shooting civil war going on while World War Two is happening. Right. Which so is which they're is fighting. Which is separate. They're fighting yeah. amongst themselves. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's you know there are both sides. Stalin is supporting one side, and Hitler supporting another side. Even though Spain is really almost irrelevant in both cases, you have to remember too, folks. Spain was neutral in World War One, right? So and it's isolated. And it's isolated I mean, by the Pyrenees. By the Pyrenees. So, so. Uh, it's it's really not as big of a thing. We skip over that yeah. so much, partially because Franco lives until seventy five. Uh, right, he's the most successful of the fascists. That's correct. He because he he rules. <clears throat> One can probably say rather successfully, when he uh, when he dies, uh, the monarchy is restored in a bloodless manner. It's almost like okay, now let's just ch- turn the page. Uh, so fascism succeeds there, whereas well, it, it succeeds as a political as a, event, right? As opposed to the tr- you know tragic and catastrophic downfalls in the other three countries that we associate with fascism. fascism. Fascism, which is Germany, Italy, and Japan. Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the Spain doesn't invade anybody. That's right. Spain doesn't and there commit in, the rape of Dan King. Spain doesn't. Therein lies one of the differences, because one of the things that these other three did in order to survive in their minds, anyway, you must expand, conquer, except whatever you want to call it. Uh, you have to have an enemy to fight. Right. Yeah. Well, they're expansionists. Fascism is, by its nature, it seems to be imperialistic. Yeah, that's something there. That it's not endemically so. Economically, there's no necessarily well. Connection it's to that. imperialistic just 
So is communism, right? Generally speaking, because it wants to expand its power. Now, it does yeah. it in the well, name of nationalism, yeah, as I opposed mean, to the workers of the world unite. When you think you're right, you want everybody else to get on board. Exactly. So exactly. when when you're convinced that your way is the best way, I mean, and here I'm, I'm you know, taking another swing at Woodrow Wilson. His idea is the same thing. My way is the best way. Get on board. That's the same idea. Then that not only is opposition wrong, it's evil, right, and yes. must be extinguished. And then you. And then you added these racialist components of, you know, not only are our opponents evil, but they're subhuman and have no value, and they're just in the way of what we want to accomplish. Well, more to the point, they must be removed. Yes. It's our duty. And like, you know, Robert's talking about here, Eastern Europe is, hey, look at all this great farmland. Too bad there's already somebody here. Right. You know, the Italy Japanese has, are, yes. are doing the same thing. Absolutely. Hey, look at China. Look at all this great farmland. Too bad there's somebody already here. Look at Korea. Look at Philippines. Too bad there's somebody already here. Look well, at all this oil. Yeah, uh-huh. they're less than us. So, we can hey. Get rid of them. We will take it because we can. Yeah. Right. It's a lot of it there. And, you know, it's interesting in that Italy is probably the least, has the least of this kind of thing going on, mm-hmm. which is... Uh, kind of strange because you know their whole thing is they've already they done it once they've already conquered the whole world once that's right that's I all mean, I mean when you're that much of a megalomaniac it's like well what does it matter anymore that's right so you know and right when they did it they Romanized everybody you know <laughs> well that's so, right they made the world Rome they did so uh, you know their whole point is they want to control the Mediterranean yeah Adolf they look is, at this, this is strictly, old hat. yeah they look at this I think as an expansion of their their influence and economic power in, in Africa in particular. And, and in Africa in particular. They, they pick Ethiopia, Somaliland as, as easy targets. Right. And, you know, the targets they pick, you know, there, there's going to be certain pushback from the other colonial powers who, who yeah. have influence there, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, they, they're also picking softer targets. And their, their impetus doesn't seem to be, oh, that's a nice country. I think I want it. Because when you look at the countries that they go after, we don't see them as these great and wonderful places that you know you would want to expand your people into. You know, when you're in Egypt, other than along the Nile, the, the Nile Delta, mm-hmm. yeah, it's desert. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. nobody really wants well, to live I in the desert. Italy, Italy also kind of understood its, uh, its limitations. You know, you can't go after the big ones, so we have to find the little bully that we can beat up. You know? There's there's probably an element to that. Yeah. yeah. We, 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 can, we can whoop these guys. We're fine probably. with letting Adolf be the big bully, but we'll be the small bully in his shadow. Yeah, the toady. So, <laughs> right. yeah. Well, and you know, Adolf, he's got all of Europe, whereas, mm-hmm. you know, we've got the Pyrenees, or not the Pyrenees, but the we've Alps. got the Alps. The Alps. Uh, to, as a, somewhat as a physical buffer, although once the airplane is invented, that really doesn't matter anymore. Right. Uh, and, you know, they, you know, Italy has always seen the Mediterranean as their pond. No, well, that's what, yeah. that's what their Mediterranean swimming means. Pool. Yeah. Right. Mariantinum is, you know, our sea. Our <laughs> that's sea. what it comes so, from. So, right, exactly. So, you know, they want to reestablish that, I think, that economic, so they, they're unique in that aspect, I think, that they are less of that, that racial uh, uh, aspect uh, when you compare them to Germany and, and Japan, uh, Spain being mainly a civil war thing, it's there's less of one there as well. Yeah, I mean, Spain, it's you know the the this leftist government is being influenced maybe by the Bolsheviks. They're destroying the church. We don't want that. We're we're upholding the church and, and all that. So. But there's also, and I, and I, I want to make sure we, we really hit this hard because, again, there is this huge piece of this that is coming out of World War One of we shouldn't have lost. Oh, we've you mean been the, stabbed the, in the back. Yeah, the, the whole. Uh, and again, yeah, this, because, this well, is we, a, we've talked about the satellite. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a myth. Let's go for the big one, the Nazi Germany. Yeah. The rise of Hitler, that's kind of what this is meant to be right, about. Right. How did this happen? This has been talked about a whole lot. Woodrow Wilson, Clemenceau, and Lloyd George deserve a whole lot of blame for that because the Treaty of Paris was just unbelievably Treaty awful. Versailles. Robert Versailles, yeah, yes. signed in Paris. Uh, 
uh, unbelievably brutal. Uh, and it was attempt, and it was Clemenceau. Germany must pay. He's it's, he's wanting payback from the Franco-Prussian War. Even all those years later, he was a boy when he saw the Germans marching down the Champs Elysees. And he said, "No, no, no, we're going to fix this." And consequently, he sets up an intolerable situation for Germany. And because of the Weimar Republic was imposed upon them, this is foreign to them. Not it, literally foreign, because it's imposed. Uh, it's we've never had experience with a democracy before. We don't really care about it, and consequently, with the economic upheaval that comes with that, well, why wouldn't you think that this is a effed up situation? <laughs> it's ripe for yeah. somebody to come in and calm the waters, just as Napoleon did after the French Revolution. I mean, you've right. got the terror. You need a strong man that's going to say, "I'll fix this," and I got a plan. But there is a a big lie at the center of this as well, of. The lie that the Germans were never beaten on the battlefield. Right. They That's were. Correct. They were beat. That's correct. They, they were suffered. never invaded, but they were beaten on the they battlefield. Were and they, and they, they equate those two things. That's right. right. So the lie that it grows up is, we were not beaten. Our soldiers, our army cannot be beaten. Therefore, we were betrayed. We were stabbed in the back. Mm-hmm. And who stabbed us in the back? The money. The, the, Jews. Jews. the Jews. That's right. They and, see, we're and again, the money. Coming up with that enemy to fight, mm-hmm. that internal uh, evil that must be expunged. Yeah. It galvanized a people that were had been disenfranchised and uh, a proud people, you know, yeah. who were who so, were yeah. at the top before World War One. They were at the top of the heap, right? So they're in many the top. ways now they're militaristically, the economically, they were a powerhouse, and yeah. now they're you know they're almost they're not beyond bankrupt. They're yeah. almost yeah, destroyed. It's a huge economic dislocation. This huge lie, and again, the, a, a, a segment of society in, in, a, in a conservative segment around Hindenburg and, and business owners saying, well, at least we're not Bolsheviks. You know, we want to guard against that. At least Hitler's not that. Right. He's, and he's, then he's national. He will save us from the Bolsheviks, which was absolutely part of it. Yes. Not only the Jews, but the Bolsheviks too. Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, I think you can't miss out on on all of these things is when they come to power, there's always that enemy, but it's always an internal enemy first. Internal mm-hmm. enemy first. Whether in Spain, it's the you know the leftists are attacking the church, or you know the the Italians are are you know this inefficient right. mess, this economic mess. It's an is, economic opponent. Just uh, Italy is almost a socialist uh, uh, revolution turned into fascism in the sense that it is. More economic than than any, than I yeah. think some of the others. Mm. Although there's always that economic. There, yeah. There's always yeah, an always economic. Another, yeah. That's that's what is the bread and butter for the people. Right. Looking for the solution because they're this, hurting. This, it, they are. Right. It, they they are. are legitimate. And they feel and like hurts. all the old ways have failed. And well, and it's obvious how why they're hurting is because of that which was imposed upon them at the end of the war. So they are going to blame those external factors: France, Britain. United States. The United States. Yeah. So, so there are obvious enemies uh, to uh, to turn on. So although in Germany they were more invented than anything else, uh, but they're obvious ones to turn to to make an enemy. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's capitalists, uh, the the oligarchs who are running things, mm-hmm. or the Jews who had almost no real power. So how you can it, be stab yeah, somebody I mean, in the back when you have no power is beyond me. Uh, but that were, doesn't matter. They were fully integrated in the German society. Right. Very much so. In, Most in every German aspect. citizens who were Jewish thought of themselves that way. They yes. were German citizens they were German who were Jewish. Citizens. Uh, yeah. So they were not some you know huge, powerful faction. That was a huge lie. Uh, uh, built up again. This, well, this and that was that was Hitler's to, own who is to blame. self delusion because he yeah. starts with a lot of well, that, and but he finds others that yeah that that. To be fair, to though, it. let's let's uh, I don't want to uh, minimize anti semitism was still alive and strong Very in Germany so. at the time. They were integrated in the sense that there there were no uh, uh, ghettos that they lived in right. like there had been in, in prior centuries. So they were part and parcel. I mean, they fought in World War One. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they fought in the German army, and many of them won medals uh, that would later be, you know, would have been denied, or they might have been given some leeway early yeah. on because they had those medals. Yeah. but very quickly that goes away because once you get to a certain point, it doesn't matter yeah. anymore. But uh, yeah, business, academia, all of that 
they're all completely integrated in German society. But that, still, and nobody that likes be- them. That becomes part of the lie, too, is, see, they're everywhere. Yes. They're everywhere. They're they're undermining us in every every aspect. Exactly. You know, people today like to talk about, you know, as if fascism, the way we understand fascism to be, yeah. could happen anywhere and everywhere at any time. We're just... You know, a split second away from yeah, it happening. Yeah, your finger snap from fascism. And while certain people on both the left and the right imitate what all of these movements have done, I don't think fascism could happen barring such an incredible catastrophic event that the very fabric of society falls apart. Right. And I'll give you a good example of that is V for Vendetta. You remember? Uh, that's it's, it's a parallel. Alan Moore did a parallel of what if the rise of Adolf Hitler took place in England during this time. In fact, uh, the uh, Chancellor Sutler, uh, you know, Sutler Hitler. It's a uh, that was the that was the Aaron. It was meant to be a parallel on that, and it. There was disease. There was uh, experimentation. All these sort of things had happened that caused this economic upheaval. It ha- it doesn't happen in a vacuum. You have to, and the way it's portrayed is the because of all these things that happened, you turned to a man who promised to save you. Yeah, and all he asked for was your silent and obedient consent. And that's kind of part of the key is again, Robert's talking about there are bulwarks against that. In the U.S., right? There were no bulwarks in Weimar Germany against that. There were no bulwarks against that. Partially, those in, bulwarks in, are the traditions and the the established norms and the laws and the laws. A, a that separation of power, an absolute yes. separate. That's what the fascists get rid of in Italy, in Germany, in Japan. There is no separation. Right. There and, is whatever we say goes. It's now law because there's no other, there's no separation. When Hitler becomes chancellor, there's no limit to the laws he can push through the Reichstag. That's right. Right. And so when they push through the idea of, well, we don't need elections anymore, I got this. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no, there's nothing in established law of Weimar that says it's like Charles I disbanding Parliament. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. where he, he rules by fiat. It's essentially the same thing. Right. Um, we have that bulwark of, no, that can't happen because this must be in place. Right. And I, this is where, and I think Alan Moore is, is, is probably the most famous example for guys like us because we know the comic stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, who, who, who have almost this fetish fantasy mm-hmm. of... Right wing, supposedly right wing fascism, coming from what we would consider a normal conservative party in either the U.S. or England, right? Because it's almost like they want to have that enemy. This is how, why I say that the, the 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 extremists on the left are kissing cousins with the extremists on the right. Yeah, because mm-hmm. they both have this fantasy mm-hmm. of somebody is causing all of our problems. Right. And yes. that there's somebody that's going to either have to pay or is driving it. Do I think Trump, for instance, was a fascist wannabe? No, because honestly, I don't think he was <laughs> not sure. too much of a goof. <laughs> not sure he knew what to do. Yeah. Well, what Alan Moore wrote, but did he, Hold on a second. Yeah. But did he employ, either intentionally or not, some of the same characteristics and strategies in many ways. Yeah, because that's part and parcel of modern politics in many ways. Yeah, The enemy, your political enemy is evil. Uh, yes. Anybody who wants to be president is a freaking narcissist. Come on. Yeah. He just happens to be one of the best examples of a narcissist that we've ever seen. <laughs> I, you know, whether you like him or not, I don't see how you can deny that. Yeah. But, and again, uh, not yeah, again, modern it, politics. Right, we don't want to do modern He's the one everybody politics. wants to go to in the yeah. U.S. Yeah. Power I, corrupts. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But I don't think that he was that... One, he wasn't that ideological. No, he wasn't. And, you know, I don't think he... I just don't think he cared that much no. about these sorts of things. No, he didn't. Uh, you know, I think the narcissism, narcissism was more important to him than it anything else. It is very much about a self-image and a self-approval 
for him. Right. He now, just wants he everybody see, to like him. Right. Now, did he see himself as a savior? Maybe, but honestly, I think a lot of his rhetoric was just that, political rhetoric. Yeah. So, while there are I mean, every, parallels, yeah. the reasons behind them are far different. Yeah. And that's why I think the, the, the left's fetish slash fancy of this stuff is not based in as much reality as they think. Yeah. Uh, because their movements, like Occupy Wall Street, which fizzled out, uh, strangely enough, once uh, a Republican was in power, that never made a whole lot of sense. You would think that it would get even bigger, but it seems to have fizzled out by then. Uh, you know, well, once you find out that your uh, pension plan is heavily invested in Wall Street, and if Wall Street goes downhill... Your suddenly your pension from your teaching job is going down the crapper too. It's like, well, maybe that's a little, you know, a little too much. Let's put the brakes on some of that uh, but, stuff. You know, that that whole again, that you know, very much Occupy Wall Street and and uh, the Trump movement are both rooted in that populism. Yeah, uh, and that's that's where the political yeah uh, no people who are in the political no. They take advantage of this stuff. Populism has to have an enemy. It does. The bankers or Wall Street or the Jews. And it's not to say populist something. movements can are, are always bad. That's not always true. No. Because sometimes there are legitimate enemies. It's just that so often they get it wrong. Yeah. As Chesterton said, you know, the, the, uh, the critic is often right about what's wrong, but he is often wrong about what is right. <laughs> Very well said. I, I think that's a really, really good way to wrap up. I, I, I hope we covered thing. all the ground. I hope we did. As best we could. I mean, we have an hour, guys. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So we, yeah. How we're we're at 56 minutes. I think we need to to move on. But we need to swing this bad boy back around and uh, go for Take one more swing at uh, Woodrow Wilson. It's all his fault. <laughs> it's but, all, it's yeah, all his fault. But, I mean, we covered a ton of the, the, the big lie, the economic collapse. The There is a charisma to Mussolini originally. Uh, there's and a charisma to Hitler. Franco oh, yeah, to Hitler. Absolutely. There's again this racialist component. Don't underestimate that. Again, it, it even plays in Japan. So it's complicated. Trevor Slattery That's has right. to say it's Trevor complicated. Trevor Slattery, as he always knows. Uh, He's but the rise of fascism is there. <clears throat> this is a big part. All of these things are a big part of it. And we could do three or four more episodes just on this, but study it. It's important. And don't. Don't study it from a pop perspective. That's a the important pop history thing. perspective. That's why we spent the time in defining all this. Really beginning. do it. Don't don't superficially again because you're you're right, Robert. Is don't just uh, blister anybody who is a patriot uh, and say, well, it's you're a you're a fascist, right? Or somebody who wants you know an adherence to the law is not a fascist. Right, you know. and to the and you know just to give a little bit of equal time, which I normally I'm not all for because you know the other side's usually a loon, but you know not everybody who wants to see some economic equality, however you want to define that, yeah. is a bleeding heart communist. You know that goes both ways. That's correct. That's right. And and, right, and back to Chesterton. Right. You you can be right about what's wrong and wrong, and wrong about, about what's, what's right. right. So, Francis, buddy. What's next? Wrap us up. What's next? Well, we're going back to Code of Honor, of course, next Ooh, time hoo. around. Yes, always one of our favorites. Uh, Robert the Hammer gets to just hammer it all home. Uh, no theme next time. We're just going to kind of free will this baby any which way we want to. Great quotations coming your way. I have no idea what they're going to be, but you're going to love it. Free wheeling. Amen. Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes publish every Friday at noon Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a comment or review because that helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.